So back in August 2017, Adam Ellis, a comic book artist, started posting some strange threads about his house being supposedly haunted by this entity called Dear David. So the original thread started off with him stating that he had a haunted house and that the entity was trying to kill him. He continues on by stating that he had a dream where he experienced sleep paralysis and saw Dear David at the end of his bed in a rocking chair. According to Adam, the figure in the chair had a misshapen head, and as it started to approach him, he woke up screaming, decided to draw what Dear David looked like, and here it is. So some time passes and he has another dream where he experiences a woman in a library. She approaches him and says, you've seen Dear David, haven't you? As at the time he didn't know the name of this entity, he's very confused and asks who? As she replies, Dear David, you saw him. So as the dream continues on, she warns Adam that Dear David is in fact dead and he only appears at midnight and you can only ask him two questions. Never ask him a third question or he will kill you. So a few weeks go by and Adam has yet another dream similar to the first where he is in bed and David is at the end of the bed in the rocking chair. So he starts to ask dear David, how did you die? Which dear David replies, an accident in a store. Adam then asks David, how did you die in the store? As David mumbles back, a shelf was pushed onto my head. Shaken, Adam asks, who pushed the shelf? In which David doesn't reply. Terrified, Adam just realizes that he asks dear David a third question. A couple months go by and Adam doesn't experience anything more. He thinks dear David forgot about him because he moved upstairs. Well, it ends up, he actually didn't. Four nights in a row, his cats start gathering at his doorway at midnight. As this is happening, he takes his camera and takes a picture through the eye hole of his door and captures this. When we zoom into the photo, you can see a shadow on the hallway wall. Unsure if this is a smudge, he takes another photo through the peephole and then a photo with the door open. When you compare the peephole photos side by side, you can clearly see a difference. And little did Adam know, this was far from over. Whether this is real or a hoax, we can't help but be intrigued by how well-written and well-documented this thread is. We highly suggest you Googling, Dear David. All right, so since y'all asked for more, we thought we'd give a part two a go. If you don't know about the Dear David haunting, check out our TikTok for part one. So, after he notices his cats constantly gathering at his door at exactly midnight, he posts this tweet. It's happening so often, he now considers it routine. As this all seems very small to us, experiencing these things one after another can get you worrying. So why not set up protection? He sets up an audio recording app to record sounds while he sleeps. As this is all intriguing, there aren't any EVPs caught, but the next set of evidence is where it starts to get pretty unnerving. After spending a weekend away, he buys a Polaroid camera and he starts taking photos around the house. But when he takes a photo of the hallway that's plenty well lit, this is what develops. He even takes a video of him taking a group of photos and lets them develop in real time to show that he's not making this up. And again, a black photo appears for the hallway shot. As weird as it is, he tries to calm himself down by pointing out that there could be a logical explanation for it. The next day, he smudges his apartment with sage, both in the hallway and also the green rocking chair he said he saw Dear David in. Unfortunately, the cleanse did not work. After months of not dreaming of Dear David, he appears in Adam's dream that very night. According to Adam, he's much smaller, almost shrunken, and he just sits there staring at him. A couple days later, some more tweets are posted. Two weeks of the cats at the door, and weeks of recording as well, and he notices a trend at 3 a.m., the recorder picks up a static electricity sound for five or so minutes. 
and then stops. Some days later, he claims he falls asleep early from being inexplicably exhausted and has a dream where Dear David is dragging him through a warehouse and Adam is just remaining silent. He acknowledges this as being dream logic, but then he ends up waking up and noticing a huge bruise on the same arm David was dragging him with. Adam tries to find the logic in this incident, but it all starts to become a lot clearer as he makes his routine walk to get coffee, noting that there's a repair shop that is always packed that is on the way to get the coffee. As he passed it, you guessed it, it's been completely abandoned and gutted, all but a wooden green chair. He simply can't ignore this and remembers. The first time Adam saw David, he was sitting in a green chair. All right, part three of the Dear David Haunting. Check out our TikTok for parts one and two. So after finding the repair shop gutted on his walk to the coffee shop and the building empty of all but a green chair, he grabs his coffee and on the way back, the doors were then shut and have remained closed since, according to Adam. After dreaming being dragged through a warehouse, then finding this one emptied out, he's officially creeped out and starts having trouble sleeping. He starts noticing the cats have a new routine with the front door. Around 10 p.m., they gather, cry for about 15 minutes, then walk away like nothing's happening. Then later that week, after the cats cry at the door, at around 10.30 p.m., he starts receiving phone calls from an unmarked number. Thinking it could deter a solicitor, he answers one call. He waits briefly for an automated answer, but nothing happens. Instead, Adam recalls just the static on the other end of the line. A static, he says, sounded very similar to the static caught on his sleep app. After a minute, the static stops and he hears nothing. As he keeps listening, he thinks he hears a faint breathing on the other end. Very faint. Then just as he's about to hang up, he hears a small voice say, Hello. The tone of the hello he mentions was unsettling as he panics and hangs up. He doesn't know what to do, but closes all the windows and turns on every single light. He stays up all night watching TV, afraid to sleep. Trying to stay logical, all of the incidents are starting to make him unable to make sense of all of them. Because of all the creepy things lining up, he moves the green chair from his room to his living room. As an upcoming trip to Tokyo is approaching, he purchases a 24-7 Wi-Fi nanny cam to watch his cats while overseas. He tests it while out one night. His phone pings him periodically, alerting him the cats are playing, you know, normal stuff. But then, at 11 p.m., he receives a notification of motion detected. So he checks the feed and sees nothing. He watches one more time and still sees nothing. But the third time, he notices something. The chair. It starts rocking on its own. Adam notes that nearby windows are always closed due to him using AC during that summer. Finding this footage unnerving, he couldn't do anything about it, so he flips his phone off and tries not to panic. 30 minutes later, he receives another motion alert and sees this. A turtle shell on the wall, which he claimed is sentimental, falls off the wall suddenly. As he comes home, he's too nervous to turn the camera back on and explains the day has been quiet anyways. Still feeling uneasy, he places the chair in the hallway and continues to hope for the best. And now part four of the Dear David Haunting. And this one gets a little gruesome, so viewers' discretion is advised. Also to those claiming this was fake because of the movie deal he acquired, this is not true. He still stands by all of the story. The company studio of whom he worked for at the time, BuzzFeed, is producing the movie with IT producer Dan Lin. Even in an interview with The Wrap, he stands by these events stating he just wanted to tell his story. So folks, Guess we got to use our own judgment here. A week then passed before another burst of tweets start. That Saturday night, while he was sleeping, it recorded the cats in the living room. It seemed to be nothing notable, but then he notices a cat freak out and jump over something invisible. Although not pointed out in the thread, if you look a moment after the cat jumps, the cup on the table moves, catching both of the cat's attention. Not sure if Adam caught that later on, but wow, that is officially poltergeist activity. One of the things as an investigator I find pertinent to the story 
are the times of the day he reports these events. He mentions writing down everything as it happens, and the random times and dates tied with a burst of tweets at a time helps validate the authenticity of these events. Not to say this isn't fake, but if so, the constant documentation really makes it more believable. But anyways, the next night is followed by some strange footage once again, but this time it's of his cat, Maxwell, doing this on and off for hours, as if looking for something or looking at something, noting it as odd behavior and also that bugs aren't an issue in his home. Adam then captures this at the end of the night. Adam mentions he can't shake the feeling something has entered his apartment and that everything feels off. Almost two weeks later, he begins to have nightmares, more intense than his normal dreams, he claims. The afternoon of September 16th, he tweeted he took a nap and had a dream he could not shake. In the dream, he is in bed and rolls over to face the other direction. On the pillow next to him was a severed head with the spine snaking down his bed. The head, somehow still alive, was staring right at him with a giant smile plastered on its face. He screams, what happened to you? The head smiles even bigger and groans. It feels great. After that, he wakes up to find it dark outside and everything completely quiet. And now part five of the Dear David Haunting. According to Adam, other strange dreams continued of dark figures staring through his windows and other weird stuff. As a way to shake that terrifying dream, he walks to a bodega nearby for a snack. As the warehouse that was boarded up is on the way to everywhere, he once again passes by it, but this time he hurries by it. He grabs his snacks and heads back. But as he passes by the doors of the abandoned warehouse, he hears a dull thunk on the other side of the shutters. He freezes in fear, but curiosity ends up getting the best of him, and he then finds a grated window next to the door that's about a foot above his head, and he talks himself into reaching up and taking a photo with Flash and then running for his life. So that's exactly what he does. Not even being able to look at the photo until after he gets home. He tries to calm down. He eats his Doritos nervously, then looks at what he captured. He mentions it looks like a different part of the warehouse, maybe an office. But then he looks at the photo again and notices something in the right hand corner. Not sure if it's eyes messing with him. He adds filters to it and he becomes convinced. It looks too much like Dear David. A few days pass quietly, and he posts about leaving for Tokyo in a few hours, adding that he hopes a couple weeks away will fix things. He then posts on his final day in Tokyo that it has been peaceful and that the cats were well taken care of. To have one less exploration, he heads to a park and finds this statue that catches his eye. As he walks around it to snap more photos, he almost drops his camera when he sees this and starts to feel dizzy. A kid with a dented head. To Adam, it feels too similar to be coincidence. He tries not to overreact and gets ready for his flight home. He posts about his arrival home with a photo of him with the cats, with a caption stating they are fine, just quote, more talkative. Nine days pass and a new thread starts about electrical issues. First, two bulbs burn out in the hallway in a week, but shrugging that off is not too out of the ordinary. He later finds his TV's backlight glitching out one night without the TV being on, noting that it's only a couple months old and that the TV has to be on for the light to work. Weirded out, he goes and grabs a bite at the only diner open at 4 a.m., then comes back home as the sun is rising to get ready for work. As he passes his front door, he thinks he hears a faint scratching sound from the other side. Unsure if he really heard it, but also too scared to put his face that close to the sound. He takes his phone and again takes a photo through the peephole. Thankfully, there's a skylight in the hallway, giving enough light for the photo. At first, they look like blurry nothingness, but as he analyzes this particular photo, he starts noticing things. Part of a face, an ear, and an eye, staring right back at him. Welcome back for part six of the haunting that went viral back in 2017, Dear David. After crucially analyzing this photo that he took through the peephole, it's now obvious to him that he needs to get someone else involved, because it's just not going to stop. Twelve days pass and he tweets that a friend had come by to cleanse the entire apartment, as well as the hallway. 
Afterwards, everything seemed to go back to normal. No more cats at the door or bad dreams. It was all starting to seem like it was over to Adam. And then, during the morning a week prior to the tweet, he was walking to work and had to pass the shuttered warehouse as usual. But this time, the metal doors were wide open, sunlight pouring in, and the warehouse empty and the chair gone. But there was one thing inside, a hearse. The warehouse had been closed for months at that point, and there seemed to be no reason it was open that day. No one was around. Always looking for that logical explanation, he thinks. Hearses have to park somewhere, right? He then tries to quit thinking about it and notes the next several days were uneventful. But on the evening of October 25th, around 11 p.m., Adam's watching TV on the couch and decides to get a beer from the fridge. And he notices both of his cats sitting at the far window, staring up at it. The window itself looked out onto the roof of the business next door. Adam looks out of the window and doesn't see anything. Maybe there's a mouse in the wall or something, he guesses. Then he heads to the fridge to get his beer. As he heads to get his bottle opener in the kitchen, he notices something. There's a window in the kitchen that also looks onto the same roof, and someone was on the roof, staring up at him. Adam immediately ducks down and turns off the lights. He peers over the window, but can't see much. His phone was in his pocket, so he grabs it and takes a photo. It's blurry and dark, but he promises someone was out there. He then tries to take a better photo and realizes the figure had disappeared. He closes all the blinds and makes sure the doors are locked and then drinks five more beers until he was too drunk to be scared. Now, when we look back at the first photo where Adam was sure someone was on the roof, there is what looks like a dark spot towards the bottom left of the photo. Luckily, being the internet, many of the followers brightened up the photo and every single one had the same evidence pop up. The dark spot was unmistakably a figure. Feeling back at square one and unsure of what to do next, Adam admits to himself that he is sure it was David on the roof and that David is not going away. Welcome back for part seven of the Dear David Haunting, which events were coincidentally happening four years from the date of this TikTok video. About a week and a half later, Adam starts a new thread it's been four months since he had the first dream of Dear David, and the night before, he had a dream almost exactly like the first time he saw him. In the dream, he saw David in a chair again, but since Adam had moved the green chair out of his room, David was now in his recliner, in which Adam has had for years. David was staring right at him, just like the first time, and again, Adam felt paralyzed in his bed and could barely move. But this time, Something was different. Still feeling immobile, he notices he's way more alert and could move his hands somewhat. David glaring right at him. Adam dreads what he knows is coming next. David was going to get out of the chair and come toward him, just like before. Panicked, Adam reaches for his phone he keeps right next to him on the bed and somehow gets a hold of it. He begins thinking, if David is going to kill me, maybe I can at least get evidence of it on my phone and he starts snapping photos in the dark. Just like Adam thought, David starts to crawl down the chair and shuffle towards him, although moving very slowly, like it was a struggle. Terrified, Adam continues taking photos. As David limps closer, he never takes his eyes off of Adam. Soon enough, they were face to face. David starts muttering something too quiet for Adam to understand. Adam watches as David's eyes roll back into his head until his eyes are completely white. Adam tries to writhe away from him, but could still barely move. He stares in horror as David begins climbing up onto his bed, still murmuring something. And that's when Adam wakes up, same as before. Broad daylight, no trace of David anywhere. The entire dream has happened enough that it also has become routine at this point to Adam. But he notes it was just a dream, so he eventually gets ready for the day and the stress of the dream melts away. He wasn't even going to tweet about the dream because it wasn't new information. But that night, he noticed something that petrified him. He goes into his phone to try and find a photo from a few days prior and finds dozens of pitch black photos on his camera roll, all from the night before. Rather than try to explain them, he tweets a series of photos from the camera roll and says to turn up the brightness because of how dark they are. This 
he says, is the one that made his heart drop. And again, thanks to other followers of the story, we found this photo that clarifies the first image quite a bit, and this one of all three together. Adam can't come up with an excuse or logical explanation for this one. He's officially beyond freaked out and certain he won't be getting any sleep. Welcome back for part eight of the Dear David Haunting. And this is where Adam starts to really dive into his own investigating. Let's get into this. 11 days pass and Adam posts another series of tweets, reassuring his followers that yes, he is still alive and that there is something he is trying to figure out how to investigate. But before letting us know he needed something substantial enough to report, the logistics of what he is trying to investigate is hard to explain. So instead he fills us in that there is an entire part of his apartment that he is just now finding out about. At least that's what he thinks. The building he lives in is the duplex. When this all started, Adam lived on the first floor, but moved to the second floor. It's a long boxy building with the business right next door where Adam saw David on the roof. Weeks prior, when posting his latest tweets of the dark photos on his camera roll, Adam mentions that just 30 seconds after sending the last tweet, he heard a loud thump above his head, as if someone above him dropped something on the floor which would have been impossible since he was in the top apartment. With no way to the roof, no ladder or trees outside, or any way from the inside except through the skylight in the hallway, Adam explains that it definitely wasn't pipes either, and that the sound was something distinctively falling to the floor. The building is old, and he knows it makes noises, but this was a new sound, and it startled him. Adam begins thinking, is there some secret crawl space in my home? He looks all over his apartment but can't figure it out. So he goes out to the hallway, and that's when it dawns on him. A mysterious hatch sits above his stairs in the hallway. He's always known about it, but always assumed it opened directly to the roof. But as this all dawns on him, he noticed that there's no way it can lead to the roof because it's actually below the roof. By checking Google Earth, he sees that the skylight is actually flush with the roof. And the hatch is about three feet below the skylight, meaning there's about three feet of crawl space between the hatch and the roof. Additionally, the hatch is level with the rest of the ceilings in Adam's apartment, which means there's three feet of empty space all over his apartment. He tweets that it could be residential codes of something or other that he might not know about, so at the time it didn't seem relevant enough to mention. But a few days after the first sound, he heard a similar thump while he was in the kitchen. Then the night before he posted these tweets, he heard something clink to the floor then roll about six feet before stopping. He knows something is going on up there. Maybe a raccoon, maybe not. He can't get over the fact that the hatch is at such a weird, inaccessible place over the stairs, but he knows he needs to investigate this. He's just not sure how. He questions maybe a pole and or a ladder from Amazon to see if the hatch even moves. Then just 10 minutes later, he tweets that he went with the pole to see if the hatch moves. And if so, he'll buy a ladder or have his landlord investigate. Welcome back for part 9 of the Dear David Haunting, and y'all won't believe what Adam finds in the mysterious crawl space. First, we know it's been some time, so Happy New Year. Alright, now it's time to get back into this story. After the last tweets on November 17th, another series of tweets start up again on the 28th. The noises upstairs never let up, and unfortunately the pole never arrived before he had to leave for Thanksgiving, so he receives it that following Friday, late at night. He tweets that he plans to investigate the next morning and heads to bed. He had barely fallen asleep when he woke up to an incredibly loud crash above him, like someone dropped a bowling ball. He bolted upright in bed and immediately felt strange, stating there was an explicably weird energy all around him. About one minute later, he hears another loud crash, and he debates grabbing his shoes and booking it, but didn't because of how bad of an idea it seemed to pass under the hatch. So he just listened and waited, though not knowing what for. The crash happens again, then again, and probably 15 more times in a row, followed by a long silence. Then he hears a similar creaky sound coming from the hallway. He registers it as footsteps, but knows it could have been anything. He stays still, but there were no more sounds after that. He lays back down, still tense and nervous, but somehow falls back asleep and wakes up to everything seemingly normal. He gets dressed and heads out for his usual Saturday morning bagel. As he makes his way down the stairs, something crunches under his feet 
and notices a pile of debris on the stairs directly under the hatch. He glares up at the hatch and notices something caught in the edge of the door, poking out. He took this photo from the floor, but it's easy to see what he's talking about. At that point, bagels were the last thing on his mind. He heads back upstairs to get the pole, sets his camera on the coat rack at the top of the stairs, and hits record, in case a demon bursts out of the hatch. In this video, he uses the pole to push open the door, and whatever was caught falls down. He jumps out of the way of whatever it was and nearly falls down the stairs trying to dodge it. Maybe it's a dead squirrel? That honestly would explain a lot. The item hits the stairs and bounces down to the first floor. Adam collapses the pole and throws it back into his apartment and heads to investigate the object that fell. At first glance, Adam's not even sure what it is. It's dingy and faded black. But as Adam finally picks it up, he realizes what it is. A small leather shoe. Adam runs back upstairs and texts his landlord what's going on, and the landlord agrees to come check it out later that day. A few hours later, the landlord is up on a ladder with a flashlight, looking into the crawl space. Adam watches below, just waiting for something to grab him and yank him into the darkness. But after looking all around, the landlord says, There's nothing up here. Oh wait, he says a moment later, and reaches with his free arm into the dark. And when he pulled it back, he had something small and round in his hands. He climbs down and hands it to Adam. It was a very old, tiny green marble. It was so worn that it didn't register as a marble to Adam at first. Its shape was also weird and had a little bump on one end. The landlord, unfazed, tells Adam to call him if anything else happens. Adam immediately runs upstairs to his office to see if he could figure out anything about this marble that made its way into his ceiling. He didn't really have much to work with and didn't really find out much, but he did figure out the bump on the marble, at least he thinks. In the early 1900s, they made glass marbles by hand and would cut the molten glass with big metal scissors, which would mean the marble is probably really old. So now he has a decrepit old shoe and a marble sitting on his dresser, thinking to himself, I guess this is the new normal. Welcome back for part 11 of the Dear David Haunting. A full two weeks pass before Adam tweets again regarding his haunted apartment. Apart from being busy, Adam recounts not sleeping well, weird dreams, constantly tired, and random sudden bouts of dizziness for the last couple of weeks. Noting that because he constantly has the earbuds in, he made a mental note to get his ears checked. Other than that, he says, everything else has been quiet. He sort of fooled himself into thinking that finding those items in the attic somehow ended all of this. Not that that would make much sense. But the week previous something strange started happening. Late that Wednesday, he woke up with a start and felt something strange, like something had just been watching him. He turns on his light, but he is alone. Still, he says, there was this overlying tangible feeling of badness, a feeling Adam was used to. A feeling that always accompanied David. Other people tweet to Adam saying David might just need help. But to Adam, that's not the case. Because every time David shows up, Adam feels a palpable sense of malice. And that's what he felt that night. Exhausted, he falls back to sleep. But again, this happens the very next night. He wakes up suddenly feeling like he had just missed seeing something. Like a candle just went out and he could smell it. He thinks about using the pet cam from the living room, but the cord didn't reach high enough to capture the entire room. So he downloads an app that takes a photo every 60 seconds and sets it on the top of his bookshelf, which he mentions is seven feet high and has a good view of his bed and the surrounding room. Then he goes to sleep. Just like before, he jolts awake hours later, feeling the same unease. He turns on the light and hurries out of the bed to check his phone. 350 photos, the vast majority of them were of him sleeping in an empty room. Leaving a couple lights on in the room for better lighting, you just see him sleeping alone for the first hundred or so photos. Then suddenly, he was there, standing on the chair at the foot of the bed, just staring at Adam.
In the next photo for a minute later, David is just staring up at the ceiling, just staring. Then he appears to just collapse on the chair. The next dozen photos are all just like this. Just David lying completely lifeless. At first looking at the photos, Adam thinks David is dead, which he admits wouldn't make any sense. Adam glancing away from the photo, looks at the chair, half expecting David to still be there, but it was empty. Then in the next photo, David is gone, the room totally empty. Several photos later, he's still gone. Adam figures maybe that was it, but continues swiping through the photos. But about 15 photos later, David was back, standing right next to the bed, just like the last time Adam saw him. Adam's heart's racing. He doesn't want to look through the rest of the photos, but knows he has to. He swipes to the next photo and his heart sinks. David was on the bed, inches away from Adam, staring down at him, sleeping. The next photo was worse. David is staring right at the camera. After that, the next minute on, there's seemingly nothing. He disappeared and the rest of the role is just Adam sleeping alone. That is, until the final photo. Adam's at loss for words. That malformed ear, the stringy hair. Adam doesn't even know what to think. He looks all over his room and can't find anything. He's so exhausted he can't process it and says even now, all he wants is sleep. Welcome back for part 13 of the Dear David Haunting, and it only seemed appropriate to film this as a winter storm is approaching. After the events reported on December 12th by Adam, his tweets go silent until January 2nd. He explains he went home to Montana for the holidays and almost immediately started to feel better, less tired and foggy. He hasn't even entertained the thought of moving, given he just thinks David will follow him wherever he goes. But being home, Adam felt safer. Everything started to improve, so maybe David was tied to the home, not to Adam. Adam starts browsing apartments back in New York. Although it being winter at the time, after all that's happened, it definitely seemed like it would be worth moving out. It was almost like there was a way out for Adam. But after a few days, Adam starts to feel strange again. One night, he gets up to go to the bathroom. And as he stands there in the dark, he can't help but feel like something is moving outside of the bathroom window. The bathroom looks out into the backyard, but it was pitch black and he could barely see anything. Being Montana, Adam deduces it down to the possible wildlife around. And sure enough, in the morning, he finds these animal tracks through the snow. The next night, the same thing happens. Adam gets up in the middle of the night and thinks he sees movement in the blackness outside. This time, he stands at the window and gazes out, straining his eyes to adjust to the night. For a long time, Adam stares out into the snowy darkness, but doesn't see anything. But just as he is about to turn away, he sees something lurch off to the right and disappear from view. Due to the darkness, Adam does try to debunk it as maybe a coyote or something. But in the morning, as Adam is getting out of the shower, he glances out of the window and notices tracks behind the garage. He can't tell what they were from the bathroom, so he quickly gets dressed, puts on his coat, and heads outside. When he gets close, his heart practically stops. These weren't animal tracks. These were footprints, very small footprints. He follows them across the backyard, but they disappear into the ditch out back. He stands there in the snow, not knowing what to do. What could he do? Welcome back for part 14 of the Dear David Haunting one of two final parts of this horror story that's left. We just released our season three finale investigation at a haunted sports bar called The Tavern, where we actually experienced a few things similar to what Adam has been dealing with during his haunting. A child entity, shoes found inside of the walls that belong to the child, and even well-lit sections of the building that appear dark through our camera lenses. Amongst other evidence, these stuck out to me as strange coincidences that I just wanted to mention. So check the link tree in our bio to watch the new episode and let us know what you think. After finding these tiny footprints in the snow that disappeared into a stream behind his family's house, Adam explains that he didn't leave his room the next few nights out of extreme fear. If that was indeed David that he saw in the snow late the other night, then that means that David could follow him anywhere. 
No matter if he found a new apartment and moved, David could still find him. He felt helpless. He flies back to New York the day after Christmas, and arriving back home to his apartment, he feels, yet again, back at square one. He's tried everything he can think of. He's saged his apartment. He's hired a medium. Nothing has worked. And what's worse, he still feels David at night watching him from different corners of the room, always getting closer and waking up right before something happens. For the past few nights, Adam's been using that app that takes photos every couple minutes, but nothing has shown up. For whatever reason, Adam says, it doesn't seem to work anymore, but he leaves it running just in case. It's picked up absolutely nothing, save for one thing, from the night before. The night was particularly bad, Adam recalls. He began to feel sick, starts having nightmares all night. He dreams that David is hovering in the corner by the ceiling of his bedroom, far off the ground. Like before, David begins mouthing something, but Adam can't hear any words. Then out of nowhere, David's hovering right above his bed, staring straight down at him. David's mouth moving faster than it should be. Adam can't move. He can only look up at David. Then suddenly, David plummets down towards him, and he feels this huge pressure in his chest. He wakes up gasping, the wind completely knocked out of him. He sits up and looks frantically everywhere, heaving for air, but there was nothing. When he finally catches his breath, he jumps out of bed and retrieves his phone from the dresser. The camera roll showed nothing to report, save for the last photo, taken just a moment before he woke up. And to quote Adam's last tweet from the night, I don't know what to do. I'm at a loss. I just don't know. Welcome back for part 15 of the Dear David Haunting. And after what just happened to Adam, he mysteriously disappears from posting. Nothing more about the photo he found of David. Not a single tweet. Then after two weeks of silence, Adam posts an apology about the long delay, citing that he wasn't sure he'd tweet again. After what happened a couple weeks ago, everything stopped, he says. He wasn't having dreams anymore and was feeling much better, even noting that he can successfully sleep through the entire night again. He continues by stating that he has actually been feeling great, and at the time, still was. But at the same time, things have been weird, too. He knows it's hard to understand, but he continues trying to explain, even though he knows it might not make any sense. Basically, Adam says, as good as things have been lately, he still can't shake the feeling that something is off. He's been sleeping fine and has lots of energy during the day, but sometimes he seems to sort of lose time. Like he'll look up at the clock and realize an entire hour has passed and he can't remember any of it. Or he mishears someone and asks them what they said, only to find out they didn't say anything. Little stuff like that. But after all that he's been through, it's not that big of a deal. And despite all of that, he felt ready to put it all behind him. So on that previous Sunday, he opens Twitter intending on informing his followers that it was over, or at least that he thought it was. He just wants things to go back to how they were, and at this point, it seems like they had. He was writing something to that effect when he notices he had way more notifications than usual. He swipes to his mentions and sees that everyone was tweeting to him about something he had posted to his Instagram stories the day before, saying they saw something weird. The story's expired, but thankfully, Adam informs us he did get screenshots, but he doesn't know how to explain it. He breaks down the previous day, explaining that he went to brunch with a friend that Saturday and posted a few unremarkable photos to his stories. He posted one more of him and his friend before leaving, and that was that. But the next day, he had a zillion messages about the third photo he posted. People had taken screenshots and sent this to him. He has no clue what happened. It looked perfectly fine on his phone when he uploaded it. He would say it's just a glitch, but he can't make sense of what's happening to his face in the picture. At the same time, maybe he can explain it. He knows what it looks like, what it probably is, but he doesn't know if he cares anymore. He really just wants things to be normal, and at that moment, things felt normal enough. He finishes the thread and lets us know he'll give an update if anything happens. Twelve days later, a tweet appears with no explanation, no caption, just this video.
And again, two weeks later, the cats gather at the door, crying.